Matthew's Gospel. Uh, so be great. Uh, you can uh, keep that um, page open. Let me let me pray for us as we come to uh, God's Word together. Uh, Father God, we do thank you uh, for your Word to us, Lord. We thank you for uh, the teachings of Jesus that we can uh, read and reflect on this morning, and we do pray that these would be uh, things that shape our lives as we seek to follow Him as our Saviour and our King. We yeah pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, Greg mentioned the Australian Open earlier. It seems to um, capture our attention every year, doesn't it? It's uh, the time of the year when uh, tennis racket sales hit their peak, as we all imagine ourselves as uh, being great tennis players. Um, but I love it. I love uh, watching the world's best compete right here in Australia. Uh, I love the quality of it. Uh, I love the nature of the competition. Uh, I love the games can go for hours and hours and then just be decided sometimes uh, by a few millimetres. Um, some games are like that. Uh, some games do come right down to the wire. Um, but other games, uh, perhaps those earlier in the tournament where uh, maybe a wild card or a qualifier comes up against one of the top seeds, well, they do their best, don't they? But it can soon become clear that uh, really um, they're in a different league to their opponent. And uh, look, maybe it's because I've been watching a lot of tennis, but I think there's kind of that feel to our passage here today. Uh, we're continuing here in Matthew's Gospel. And what we see here is this conversation uh, between Jesus and the religious leaders. Uh, they're trying to trap him in his words with uh, tricky questions. But each time they come at him, well, Jesus seems to return, serve, and wipe them off the court. Uh, and then after they've all had a go and failed, well, at the end, Jesus asks a question of his own. And his opponents really have no answer. And so that it finishes, as we saw there, as was just read to us in verse 46, saying that from then on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. And that's uh, really the outline of our passage today. If you've got a newsletter, it's set out for you there. Uh, we see that the religious leaders have these three questions for Jesus. Um, first about taxes, uh, second about the resurrection, uh, and then third about the law. Uh, but then Jesus asks his own question, uh, which is all about his identity. It's all about who he is. And so that's what we're gonna consider today. And um, and as we do, I think the challenge for us is to be those who not just sort of cheer Jesus on like spectators in the crowd, uh, but pe to be those who listen carefully to these words of Jesus and that these would be things that we put into practice in our lives. Um, so let's jump into it. And uh, we, we picked up this series uh, last week in Matthew's Gospel. We started there at uh, the start of chapter 22. Uh, where we heard Jesus tell a, a parable about a wedding feast, uh, which was a picture of the coming kingdom of God and how uh, the, the invitation to that kingdom now goes out to all people. But that was uh, the third of three parables in a row that Jesus uh, had told that are explicitly aimed at the religious leaders, uh, primarily the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Um, and in those parables, well, Jesus is explaining uh, why their time is over. Uh, he's explaining that their unbelief has resulted in their rejection and that the kingdom is now open to all people, including Gentiles. And so it's not surprising that we now see on the back of those three parables, the religious leaders come together at this point in opposition to Jesus as they, they test him with this series of questions. And firstly, they come at him with this question about taxes. So let me read that again, see how it begins in verse 15. It says, Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. It's all dripping in sincerity, isn't it? Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? 
But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius and he asked them, Whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. Now, as we see this exchange here, this is not uh, really a new thing. Um, The religious leaders uh, we've seen in previous occasions in Matthew's Gospel have come at Jesus with hard questions, trying to trip him up. But I think it does go up a a notch here. Um, And I mentioned last week that this section that we're in, this is all the final week of Jesus' life on earth. And so this is all moving towards a climax where the religious leaders will have Jesus killed and uh, they're looking for a way to do that. They're looking for a way to to trap him and to find a way that they could do away with him. And so they come at him with these questions. Now this first question and the answer that Jesus gives, this is a passage that's quoted a lot in thinking about um, the church's connection to government and how much we should be connected to the government and things like that. Um, I don't think Jesus is really trying here to give the definitive answer on that big topic in this short exchange. Um, But let's try and unpack it a little bit. And one thing to see here, I mean, that's pretty much exactly the same today as it was back then, um, is that taxes, well, no one really likes them. Um, Taxes have never been popular. And uh, a good way to start an argument is to uh, bring up the topic of taxes. Uh, The saying goes that you shouldn't talk about politics, money or religion in polite company. Um, All of those things really come up in this first question. But the, the question they put to Jesus is basically, should we pay tax to Caesar or should we not? And it's a good way to try and trap him because, well, there's really no right answer to this question. Um, If he says yes, well, some people will be upset because they don't want to give the oppressive government their money. But if he says, no, you shouldn't, well, then the religious leaders will go to the Roman leaders and tell them that Jesus is trying to incite a tax rebellion. And uh, in fact, this is the only time that you see both the Pharisees and the Herodians, these two groups teaming up together Um, The Pharisees were the largest group among the the Jewish leadership uh, and the Herodians, well, they represented the Romans. And so here here they are both together, uh, really both sides of the political aisle. And uh, no matter how Jesus answers, well, he is bound to upset one or the other. Well, at least that's what they think. Uh, But Jesus knows what they're doing. And he quite bluntly points out, doesn't he, why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? Which is a great opening line. Um, I did a bit of debating in high school. I never learned that one. But he gets a coin and he says, whose likeness is on it? Caesar's. Well, then give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Which is a great response because he doesn't make a statement here about, you know, well, let me tell you what I think an appropriate tax rate should be. Or, you know, let me tell you about oppressive governments. Instead, he answers the question here in a way that they're they're all just astounded. They're amazed. And essentially, I think what Jesus is saying here is it's money. You know, why, why are you so attached to it? You know, just pay the taxes. Maybe you don't like it, maybe that seems unfair, but it's money. And if you think that this is the thing that you're going to trip me up on, well, no, it's, it's got Caesar's face on it. Let him, let him have it. It's a great answer that Jesus gives, and I think certainly there's much more to say about how Christians relate to the government in our day, and I don't really think that's the big point here. I think there's other better parts of the New Testament to explore that question. I think the main challenge for us here is seen in this language that Jesus uses. So he says, whose likeness and inscription is on the coin? 
Well, Caesar's got his face on the coin, so give that to him. But then he says, give to God that which is God's. And see, we need to ask, well, where is God's likeness and inscription? And the answer is, it's on you. It's on your very person. You as a human being made in the very likeness of God. And so what he's saying is, you know, go ahead and give your taxes to Caesar or to any human government for that matter, but give to God yourself. Give him your total allegiance. I think that's the big idea that Jesus wants to communicate here. And that's uh, really the first shot there from the Pharisees and the Herodians. But then second up, trying to trap Jesus here, are the Sadducees. Uh, So take a look now as I read from this, this second question from verse 23. It continues, that same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teachers, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. Now, there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and the third brother, right on down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? So that's the trap. What does Jesus say? Well, they replied, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, sorry, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. And so that's strike two for the religious leaders. Um, This time it's the Sadducees who step forward with their question. Uh, They are a smaller group than the Pharisees, but together those two groups made up the ruling council at the time, the Sanhedrin. And a major doctrinal distinction between them was about the resurrection. Uh, And you might say that's a pretty big difference. I mean, one is staking the whole of their life on the belief in a world to come, the other is not. Uh, and the story they tell to Jesus here, it's most likely a story that the Sadducees often pulled out to, to argue against the idea of a resurrection. And you can kind of imagine the Pharisees in the background just rolling their eyes and thinking, here we go again. But um, this is the question. It's the story about a woman who has a husband and all of these brothers um, who she marries, and one at a time they just keep dying. Now, I reckon if you were in that family and, uh, you know, maybe you were brother number four, brother number five, brother number six, I mean, you'd you'd start to be feeling pretty nervous, wouldn't you, on your wedding day? Uh, What's going on there, you might be thinking. Anyway, by the end, the woman's been married to seven husbands and then the question comes, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be? What's going to happen then, Jesus? How do you explain that one? And he replies simply, quite bluntly, you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. And he explains that the resurrection life is not going to be exactly the same as our life now. And part of that is that we won't have husbands and wives when all things are created new. Now that might be kind of a troubling thing to hear for some of us who are married. Um, This is saying that that closest relationship will not continue in the same way. And so I might want to ask, why is that? And we kind of thought about it a little bit last week in our our passage about um, the the great wedding banquet uh, that Jesus spoke about. Um, Because corporately, in the new creation, in that coming wedding banquet that we thought about, well, we, we are the bride of Christ. So it's not that we won't enjoy intimate relationship, obviously it's very different, but but corporately, the church is the bride and Christ is the groom. 
And so we're not married to one another, but we're given to Christ as his church. Now, like the previous question, Jesus doesn't go into great detail on this topic. And again, I think it's probably a topic where we might have all kinds of questions about the, you know, the nature of the resurrection life, what it's going to be like. Um, clearly, it's not going to be exactly the same as our life now. But also, I don't think that Jesus, what Jesus says here will negate everything. Um, I don't think it's memory completely wiped or anything like that. Uh, I don't think it'll be that we, weren't, we don't even remember who we were married to or uh, things like that. I think what's being said here really is that, that our identity then will be so grounded in our relationship with the Son of God that, that all other relationships that we'll look back on with fondness will just pale in, in comparison. So Jesus is saying that uh, there is... Um, there's, I think there's continuity, but there's also a difference between uh, this life and the next. But then the way that Jesus defends the reality of the resurrection, I think that can be a little bit hard to see here straight off. So we need to listen carefully to the language he uses. Um, you notice he quotes there from the Old Testament, uh, from the book of Exodus. He says, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And the key here is uh, understanding that God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, that, that's a quote from Exodus chapter 3, uh, which is something God spoke hundreds of years after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died. But what is being said here is that God, when he speaks that, is still their God. I presently am their God, which means by implication that they are still alive, alive with God after their life on earth had ended. And so in this way, by quoting that scripture and that part of the scriptures that the Sadducees themselves recognised as being authoritative, Jesus clearly affirms the resurrection of the dead. And so again, he shows up the lack of understanding of the religious leaders who he says, know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. So for a second time, we see Jesus showing up the religious leaders and seeing really that Jesus is the one that we need to listen to about these most important matters. Which brings us then to the third uh, question. This time it's the Pharisees back for another go uh, with a question about the law. Uh, verse 34 it says, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, I think it's worth considering why do uh, they ask this question here about the law? Um, because it doesn't seem as uh, tricky a question as the, the previous two. Uh, I mean, Jesus knows what the commandments are. In that passage that we read uh, from Deuteronomy earlier, that's at least one point in the Old Testament where it seems that uh, the law is being condensed uh, to, to see how love is really central uh, or at the heart of our obedience to God. So what's probably going on here, I think, is not so much a question about uh, does Jesus know the law, no, but more an accusation about does Jesus take the law seriously? Because the Pharisees, as you're probably aware, they were the sticklers for, for the law. And uh, through Jesus' ministry, well, well, they've seen Jesus doing all kinds of things that bring his law-keeping into question. Think back to some of the things we've heard in Matthew's Gospel. He, he lets disciples pick grain on the Sabbath. He heals people on the Sabbath. He does all sorts of things uh, resulting in him being accused of being a glutton and a drunkard. I mean, does this guy even know what the law is? I think that's the sense of it. 
Well, of course, he knows what the law is. I mean, he wrote it. And he gives them this summary here very quickly. It's about love for God and love for your neighbour. That's Jesus' answer. The entire law rests in these two. See, for the Pharisees, Jesus is a threat to their upholding of the law. But the difference here is that Jesus loves the actual law. Not all of their added rules, not all of the extra stipulations and the prohibitions that the Pharisees had made up. But he loves the actual law, which teaches love. And that is how you keep the law. Not by building a fence around it, but by putting it into practice. And he says, you can't do one without the other. The way that we love God is by loving those around us. The two go hand in hand. So it's not about knowing which of the 600 or so commands in the law of Moses gets top priority. It's about living this new way of life, this new way of love, which flows from knowing God's great love toward us. So three questions, and it's uh, fail after fail after fail from the religious leaders. But then the passage finishes as Jesus serves one back at them. And he asks them this question about his own identity. So see here, finally, from verse 41. It said, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David. They replied, we said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? And no one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Now, again, this is a great response from Jesus. They've had their turn at trapping him, but Jesus just now needs one question to wipe them off the court. And his question essentially is, whose son is the Messiah? And they reply, son of David. Okay, well, why does David call him Lord? And the answer to that question is all about who Jesus is. It's because Jesus is the eternal son. He is both the son of David by lineage in the flesh, but he is also God incarnate. And so he is the eternal son of God. He is both David's son and David's Lord. But none of these religious leaders seem to have had their head around that at all. And so these people who think that they are the ones with superior knowledge and understanding of the scriptures, well, Jesus shows that they haven't even figured out the answer to the most basic question, the identity of who the Messiah is. Now, what Jesus claims here about himself, this is, of course, is scandalous to them. This is what will ultimately get Jesus arrested because this is the proof that they need to put Jesus on trial for blasphemy. But it is interesting to consider that for these religious leaders, this is not something that they had understood, that the Messiah would be God himself, God come in the flesh. Even though we might look back in the Old Testament and see all of those prophecies and scriptures pointing that way, but they, they had not pieced that together. Instead, they were looking for a, a man, a, a descendant of David, a, a superior Messiah, someone chosen by God, but they were not thinking that God himself would wrap himself in flesh and come to save them. But this is what Jesus proclaims about who he is. It is what the writers of the New Testament are then at pains to point out, that he's not just anointed as a man, but that he is God in the flesh, the eternal word who took on our humanity, and made his dwelling among us. And as we reflect on that today, well, now this of course is still scandalous, that Jesus is not just a man, not just a great example of love, not just a great or superior teacher, 
but that he is God come among us. God who came to us. God who came for us. God who was crucified. God who became sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Friends, that is the wonderful good news, but it is still the stumbling block, what we claim about who Jesus is. And at the end of this passage, this series of questions, well, that's kind of how Matthew leaves it. We're left to sit with that and and those claims about Jesus. We're left to think, how will we respond to who he is? Because what we're shown here today is not just that Jesus is a great teacher. I mean, he certainly is that. He's the greatest teacher who ever, who's ever lived. But he's also so much more. He is the Lord. And friends, I pray today that we would not just marvel at him as a teacher, but that we would believe the good news of what he has come to teach us. And that these would be things that shape our lives as he he calls us as those created in his image to give ourselves to him to give him our total allegiance as he reveals to us the reality and makes possible for us the resurrection life to come and as he demonstrates in his own life and ultimately in his own death the love of god and so models the way that we are to love those around us. Let me pray uh, for us that we would hear those things and and live them out in our lives. Let's pray together. Our Father God, we do thank you this morning for this teaching of your Son, the Lord Jesus, teaching us to give ourselves wholly to you, uh, to trust you for the life to come, to love those around us as you first have loved us. And Lord, we thank you for that great love demonstrated for us in that he who was Lord of all became servant of all and gave his life as a ransom for many. And so be with us, we pray, in this week ahead as we trust him and as we live for him. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.